Welcome to Living Your Greatness. Each episode, we bring on great people to inspire you to achieve your greatness. We discuss topics all related to health and wellness. Listen to world-class stories, learn valuable lessons, and turn knowledge into action. It is now time for you to unlock your inner greatness. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, and today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Gareth Soloway. For those of you that don't know Gareth, he is the Chief Market Strategist and CFO for In The Money Stocks. Gareth has been an avid swing and day trader since his days at Bingham University, where he studied economics. After college, Gareth quickly excelled as a financial advisor, helping clients get their financial houses in order. While helping others gain financial independence, he continued to study the day trading and swing trading world, developing a unique market philosophy. Gareth day trades and swing trades anything and everything. If it is moving and has a chart, he can make money on it. Gareth has called major tops and bottoms on stocks, crypto, commodities, and more using his cycle analysts. He follows price, pattern, and time while analyzing human psychology. He is known in the trading world as the Oracle of Investing. So Gareth, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Ben, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Let's kind of get kicking here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you spend your formative years growing up in the United States? What inspired you to become a chief market strategist and what led to the birth of In The Money Stocks? Oh yeah, so so it's it's an interesting story for sure. So I I I, I was born in Colorado, um, but when I was one, we moved to just outside of Boston and Massachusetts, and then when I was probably about seven, we went to New York. So we were kind of bouncing around. Both my parents were teachers um, at at a private school. Um, a lot of people think you get paid a lot at private school, but not at necessarily at all private school. So so we were kind of lower middle class income wise, and we didn't really have a lot. So I was never exposed to investing early on. It was always you know something that I had never honestly heard of. I didn't know what the stock was back then. Um, it wasn't until high school where there was an investment club, and I was kind of getting in the mode of of you know, okay, what do I need to do to co- for college or university to look good on my resume, right? You know, when I apply. And so I was like, all right, this investment club looks pretty interesting. Let me join it. And I joined it. And it happened to be in the late 90s when the dot-com bubble was kind of being created. And for those of you that don't know the dot-coms, it was in the late 90s. The internet was just emerging as something that everyone could use, much like crypto. Um, And the stocks were just doubling, tripling, quadrupling. I mean, 10 times. It was so much like cryptocurrency today. And I turned my fake 100,000 account into like 300,000 in a matter of weeks or maybe a month or so. And, you know, I was sitting there and I'm looking at, at this and it was fake money. But I was like, you know what? This is incredible. If I can figure out how to do this, if I can do this as a career that's it for me. I've got to go into it. I got to figure this out because this is life changing. I mean, this is you know someone who maybe got an allowance of a dollar a week type thing. I mean, and here here it is, you know, looking at a fake account but still multiplying it out. So from that point on, I was like, I was a one track mind. I went to college. I, I went to you know Binghamton as you mentioned, and I majored in economics. Not because I thought economics was interesting, just because I was like, okay, what's my fastest path to being a trader, a stock trader, a, you know, a commodities trader, whatever it will be. After college, I worked for MetLife, which is more of an insurance company, but they do wealth management. And, you know, I was on the wealth management side, but I it hated it, right? I mean, it was like, you're the low man on the totem pole. You you have to do all the cold calling. So I would call people up. They'd hang up on me. They'd say, go, you know, what yourself? Like, it was just, it sucked, right? So, so basically, after a year, I quit and I just went, I took $10,000. That's all I had at the time. And I said, I'm going to trade my own money. And I sucked at it. I, I, I was horrible at it, right? So I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had invested a little bit between college and then, but it was all like kind of just dabbling with a little bit of money. And I started to trade and I lost money. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to give up on this, even though my 10,000 went to like 3,000. So I, I worked three jobs on the side, right? So I was working as a bartender at night. I was a bartending instructor on the weekends, teaching people how to, I mean, there was just, I was in the catering business on the weekends, anything I could do to replenish my trading account. Um, And that was really the key there, that dedication saying, I will not give up. 
you know, I got smacked down 500 times. I mean, I kid you not, you know, any person that's trying to do something that's, that's a big thing, you know, that feeling of just like, you know, the doubt, can I really do this? And then, then saying, no, I will not give up. And so finally I started over time, I started to turn the corner and, and I started to see more and more profitable trades. And I started to notice that charts when they do this happen to usually bounce this way, where, you know, there was things that I was starting to notice over time that changed the way um, I would make my trades. And that was the key pivot point. I started to slowly make money and then eventually it snowballed. At that point in 2007, I created InTheMoneyStocks.com with my business partner. And uh, we decided to teach people this technical analysis, if you will. So, I mean, it's 2007. Here we are in 2022. It's been an amazing ride. Um, but again, I, I want to express to people that there's no easy pill to take. There's no easy answer. You don't just wake up one day and become an expert trader. You have to either pay the market which is a very, very expensive, or you have to pay someone to teach you, which is usually the, the cheaper version. <laughs> Thanks a lot for kind of sharing like your story and kind of how you got to where you are today. I always find it's interesting to hear how someone goes from, you know, a beginner and then all the way, kind of like you said, to get into that expert level. Um, and it does take time. It does take a lot of failures, kind of like you captured with us and also successes too, right? Of getting there. How challenging was it, you know, to go from, you know, working in the corporate life or even, you know, doing all those cold calls and then eventually, you know, throughout time, you know, doing different odd jobs and then eventually creating, you know, your own kind of self-employment with Nick Santiago. So you guys are self-made entrepreneurs. If you could just share a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think my entrepreneurial spirit, you know, it started even before that. I, I was one that I would collect baseball cards and basketball cards and stuff like that. So I still remember at that early in, you know, in like lower school and even in early in high school, you know, I'd get, I'd get the baseball price guide and the basketball price guide. And I'd be like, all right, have, has my Michael Jordan gone up from 50 cents to 60 cents, right? Or something like that. And so it was kind of that mentality of like investing already and trying to make money that kind of pushed me in that direction. It was just on a multiple times with bigger money once I got into the investing world. But there's no doubt that like, you know, in the beginning, having a boss and having to do kind of the grunt work, you know, it's humbling, but it also kind of shows you like, it shows you, okay, what don't I want to have to do in life? I want to be my own boss. I want to be independent. I want to be the one making the calls. And I think you have to find something if you're going to be an entrepreneur it has to be something you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about it, you'll never dedicate your literal whole life. I mean, you know, there were days where I would wake up at six in the morning or so, and I wouldn't go to bed till two in the, in the morning the next night. And that's because I loved what I did, but it was also because that's what was required to make it successful. So especially once we started the company, I mean, getting any company off the ground takes so much effort and so much work. And I mean, there were, there were times where we'd have a great span and then we get, you know, have a bad spurt where I would question like, Hey man, is this going to survive? And this was early on. And then we'd come back and then slowly we'd build up more. But I mean, it is, it's, it's emotional because you care so much. It's not just a job where you can be like, oh, I'll go get another job, but it's, it becomes your passion and it becomes your life. And that's, and that's pretty wild stuff. Absolutely. And I, I think you also described that whole feeling of that process of, of kind of any entrepreneur is that whole roller coaster, right? Yeah. So all the highs and then lows, or we could even bring this here too, you know, in terms of even like the stock market, right? All these highs yeah. and lows, but, um, but yeah, no, th thanks for giving, you know, a bigger feel for that. Um, and I, I definitely do agree that when your heart is in it, um, it's just a matter of time, right? So it's, it's kind of not an if, it's just a matter of when, right? So yeah, no, I want to congratulate you guys on that. That's, oh, that's super you. exciting. And I actually want to go to another question before we kind of get going with, you know, looking at the charts and stuff is I also understand, you know, that you are a big family man, you know, and, and I know Sarah, your wife actually kind of helped set up this interview. That's awesome that she's part of this journey with you. What advice would you give, you know, to anyone that is a father or a mother that's looking to have, you know, better work, family life balance? Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that question is, is important for, so number one, you need a great partner, you know, Sarah, you know, she, she's a nurse or she has her, she's a registered nurse, but when we moved to Florida, you know, we decided, well, you know, she can devote a portion of her time to the kids and then a portion of the time to helping me with the company since I was so busy, which then freed me up to be with the kids a little bit more, but it's certainly, I mean, as a, as someone who starts a business, 
there are unfortunately certain sacrifices. Now there's, there's positives and negatives, right? So the, the negative is sometimes I have, you know, obligations into the evening and maybe I only see the kids a little bit. The positives are that I work from home, right? So I can jump off my, you know, when I have an hour break during the day, if the kids are home, I can go spend the time with them. So there's different kind of pros and cons there. The beautiful thing about it is, is as your business grows, yes, you get busier, but you can afford to hire people to kind of take some of that away as well, some of that workload away. So again, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's such an interesting thing. And, and again, you know, yeah, Sarah's just a, an amazing wife and she, she's, she's there for me all the time. And I'm, it's awesome that she reached out to you and that we could do this interview. Thanks for kind of giving us a background there of how it's been working for you guys. So Gareth, I want to move now more into, you know, you are known by a lot of people, especially in like the trading world as like the Oracle of investing. So how did you earn this nickname and why are you highly respected by investors for this? Yeah, I, I think the Oracle of investing more refers to the fact that I don't discriminate, right? I mean, you have some people that are like, okay, well, I only trade stocks or I might only trade these three stocks or I might only trade crypto. The beautiful thing about looking at charts is that you can invest in anything. There's either a short or a long, or there's nothing to do, and you have to be ready to sit on the sidelines. So, you know, for example, you know, cryptocurrency was at these crazy highs back in November, and everyone was calling for a hundred thousand, and the charts were just not saying that to me, and I had no problem. You know, one of those things in the career, and I think this goes for any business person, you have to be willing to stand up and just say what you're seeing. You know, you might, it might not be the popular view, but you got to do it. And that's how you make a name for yourself. And, and again, from the very beginning, whether it was in 2007, before the, the, um, the re great recession, where I was like, all right, guys, something's wrong here. Look at what's going on in the charts. Look at what's going on under the underbelly of the market or the crypto high here and being bearish, you know, you have to just be ready to say what it is. And that's how you get respect in the business, not by telling people what they want to hear, but by sometimes telling people what they don't want to hear, they're going to call you all the names in the book, but eventually they're going to say, you know what? He told me the right thing. I got to respect that. Absolutely. And it takes also a lot of courage to do that, right? Because kind of like you said, right? People want to hear what they want to hear. Um, and uh, it's good to have individuals like you who are more cautious or what I would like to use is less emotional because you right. actually follow the charts, you understand the charts and there's other experts out there, you know, like Steve Penny, as well as Dave Brady, mm -hmm. you know, um, in kind of like the trading space. Right. Um, so those are some other great people, uh, kind of like yourself who are, who are always kind of that cautious eye. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think what you're saying is hundred percent right. Is that in investing, if you look at average investors, it's every decision is based on emotion. And unfortunately, when you base it on emotion, you're usually going to enter at highs and, and sell at lows, right? That's where your highest emotional response will be. The beautiful thing about following charts is that there's no emotion in it. You, it's either overbought, oversold, it's into resistance, it's into support, and it takes away that emotional kind of edge. And once you can get rid of that emotional edge, you'll find that you start getting to be, you know, basically the odds are in your favor or at least of having more winners. Absolutely. For sure. I think something that's pretty obvious now to not only like the market, but even just the average person right now, whether it's in North America or even in Europe, but it's pretty obvious that inflation is running hot. If we look at the US, the rate of monetary inflation is now over 7%. And uh, I guess my question to you is, do you think it's going to go higher this year? What do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do? If the Fed does decide to increase rates, will it impact like the markets? Um, so I, I know that's a lot of questions, but I'm pretty curious to, to get your opinion on that because I know even some of my friends or even myself, if we go to the grocery stores, you know, and if we look at mayonnaise, you know, two years ago, it was less than $3.99 and now it's almost doubled, right? It's like $6.99. Yeah. So it's getting pretty obvious now. So I'm curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So, so that's, there's the inflation side. Yeah. I mean, we, we got a PPI number here in the U S just, I think it was yesterday that was close to 10%, which is very, I mean, that's amazingly high on the producer side and inflation on the consumer side was like 8% or so. Um, I do think it's close to topping out, meaning that I have levels on oil that actually are telling me that we should see a sell-off on oil soon. Oil coming down should bring at least head, uh, headline core inflation down. And I do think the supply issues are going to slowly start to, you know, the, supp the supply bottlenecks are going to slowly start to kind of abate. 
So my guess is inflation will start to come down. That's going to be this little olive branch that a lot of investors are going to love. But I do worry, and, and my, my forecast is showing that inflation won't go back to 2%. So, you know, people need to start to prepare for a constant inflation of probably four to five percent for many years to come. And the tricky thing with that is that, number one, it makes it very hard for anyone that's kind of, you know, just getting by when these prices continually are going up. But it also puts it in, in a, an issue for the for the Federal Reserve. Right. The Fed, you know, they can raise rates right now because unemployment is very, very low. You know, we have what, three point nine percent or something like that. I mean, historically, extremely low unemployment. The problem is going to arise when we see the Fed hiking rates, which inevitably slows the economy. And when you slow the economy, unemployment will start to go up. So if you have headline inflation at four to five percent and then unemployment, let's say, goes to eight percent. Well, what do they do? You know, do they start printing money again, which then is going to push in, uh, uh, it's going to push inflation, let's say, to eight percent again or 10 or 12 just to bring down unemployment or how do they handle that? And it's going to be, I mean, this is, this next phase is going to be one of the most volatile for the markets because the fed is, is, is in a hard position. It was easy when we saw inflation sub 2% because then they could pump as much money as they wanted to, but with inflation higher, it, it's really going to be problematic. So my guess is again, you know, you're going to see the fed continue to push up rates. The stock market will come in. The economy will slow by the second half of this year. And then the question is, at what point does the Fed say, okay, the unemployment rate's rising too much. We need to start now stopping the hikes and actually start putting money back into the system. And then you start this whole inflation unemployment battle that's going to be nasty. All right. So Knowing that information, do you think then the central banks seem to be caught between a rock and a hard place? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it is a rock and a hard place. Um, I do believe that it is something in the making of it uh, that they made themselves. Um, the Federal Reserve and all central banks have been very much about, you know, making sure that people have jobs and and that recessions don't occur. I've always said that it's very natural. It's it's a it's a cycles expansionary cycles and recessionaries or, or, you know, you know, cycles that kind of come under the bar of growth are very normal. You know, think about the cycles of the sun around the earth and, and the cycles of the season. I mean, everything has a cycle to it. And when you let it take its normal course, there's expansionary periods and then there's recessions, but the recessions are not ridiculous, right? It's a two-year recession with a little bit higher unemployment, but it's not horrible. When the Fed got involved, they started to keep the market in these expansionary periods for much longer. And that created when we did get in a recession, just like 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009, that the recessions are much worse. It has to compensate on the opposite side. And so I'm really worried that we're, we're setting up for the biggest of all, you know, something along the lines of the Great Depression, because they have created such massive, you know, you know, growth period. I think it's been the longest expansionary period in the history of, of the markets, at least since they've tracked it. And then you have to look at, OK, well, what's coming down that's going to kind of compensate on the opposite side? So it, it's a it's a crazy rock and a hard place. Um, I wish the, the Fed had just been. You know, one of the tricky things here in the U.S., and I'm not sure globally if this is it, but we have a dual mandate here. And the dual mandate says they have to pay attention not only to inflation and the money supply, but also unemployment. As soon as they got that mandate in 1977, that was, in my opinion, the beginning of the downfall of the Fed. Because, you know, think about it like a parent. You can be the parent that spoils the kids and then they're going to misbehave. Or you could be the parent that's strict and then you have you know, a very, you know, a well-behaved child. You can't be both, right? You can't sometimes spoil and sometimes be strict. And the Fed, because of the unemployment mandate, they've always been the spoiler, right? They've been, okay, well, we'll just print more money because then we can see the unemployment rate come down. And that's spoiling, it's giving candy to the baby. But now all of a sudden they're like, okay, well, now we have to be the strict parent. It doesn't work like that. And that's the problem here. And, and again, I do worry about the next 10 years or so in this market. I really like that analogy, like the whole parent and spoiling. I've never heard that before, Ashley. And uh, it's absolutely true. That's exactly what they've been doing, right? They've been printing money out of thin air yeah, um, and just continued and continued. And kind of like you said, now they're, they're transitioning to a, a stricter role, right? So it's definitely coming. Um, so if you were the Federal Reserve, what monetary policy measure would be in your favor to curve inflation? Wow. <laughs> 
Oh, well, thank goodness I'm not in that position because it, <laughs> it would be pretty nasty to do. But I mean, you know, at some point the market has to take its medicine, right? It has to, it has to reset. And, and my concern again is that we're at such a bubble level that whenever the reset does occur, that you could likely see this kind of, you know, depression. We thought the 2008, 2009 was bad. I hate to say it, but the money printing was 10 times that over the last, you know, 10 to 13 years from 2009 on, which means the next dip is going to be way, way worse. So I do think there's going to be a reset. Um, you have to, at some point, just let the markets do that. The problem is it's going to be much more painful because of what the Fed did than if the Fed had just stayed back and let the system function as a normal system should. So again, you know, I don't know what I would do at this point, but you know, it's, and it's so tricky, right? Cause the fed, the fed is human. I mean, they're humans. Um, you know, you don't want to see people out of work and the, the politicians put pressure on the fed to, to make sure that they print enough money. So people go back to work. And I understand that, but at the same time, you at some point have to stand up and say, Hey, listen, this is what has to happen. And we just have to take our medicine and deal with it. Okay. Gotcha. Good answer. Um, so Gareth, I, I listened to an interview that you did with David Lynn from Kiko News at the start of this year. And what struck me was that you are most bullish on gold for 2022, especially after Bitcoin had an incredible year last year and I think it was up 72%. But you said gold will be the best performing asset and will rise 50%. So a question that I have is, you know, what makes you have such strong conviction that this is going to happen? And then my other question is, when is this going to happen? Yeah, so really good question. And, and, and there are charts that are behind my predictions. Um, the first one is that number one is I, I just don't, I think that we're in a period of deleveraging as the Fed tightens and therefore the stock market valuations have to come in, meaning stock prices have to continue to come in and by default, crypto has to come in as well. So again, you know, not only do I think gold will perform really well, but it's also the fact that I think these other two assets will underperform and probably have negative years this year. Now, one of the fascinating things about gold is, you know, I always look at history. I'm a big history buff. And I've looked back at 1973 to 1985, that last period when we had basically 10% inflation, because that was, again, 75 to 85 was the last period. And what you notice is that in 2018, so let's just talk about you know a few years ago, 2018, four years ago, you had a move up in gold from about $1,100 to about 2000 and change, right? So it was about a, almost 100%, about 80% move up. Since 2020, gold has gone sideways to very slightly lower. Now, just keep in mind, remember, two years up and then almost two years sideways. Now, if you go to 1973, gold had the same two-year move up. Then from 75 to 77, it had the same sideways consolidation, slowly lower move. And then from 75 all the way to basically 78, it went from about, I think it was about $150 to $900 an ounce. And so, again, if you look at the inflation numbers and then you look at the pattern formation since 2018 on gold and match it over 1973 to 77, it is identical. And so, again, the idea is, and, and again, notice, you know, 100, 100, 150 to 900 is a lot more than just 50 percent upside. So so I think I'm being a little bit more conservative because it's hard. I'm not going to go out and say, hey, gold's going to go up 5000 you know, or 800 percent. But I think it's important for us to recognize that. The pattern is repeating. The inflation is repeating. Periods of history, even if they don't fully repeat, they rhyme usually. And we can learn a lot by looking at history. So again, you know, it makes sense that an undervalued asset or, or an underinvested asset is one like gold. A lot of money went out of it for Bitcoin. The longer Bitcoin stays in a bear market, the more money will come back. And I really do believe that you're setting up for a higher inflation period, not just for a year or two, but you're going to be at least at 4 to 5% for many years to come. And that's just another positive for gold. Okay. So I, I understand that whole situation and thanks for, you know, bringing like the different years. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but what happens uh, to gold as well as Bitcoin if Russia invades Ukraine? Because I know there's a lot of talk about that. So mm -hmm. is that in favor? Is that, is that another catalyst or is that going to be against it with all the fear? What's going to happen? Yeah. So, so usually at least historically, and again, all we can do is look back at history, but, but when when another country invades, you know, like when Crimea was taken over by Russia, it was a very short term reaction in the markets. And then the markets 
quickly kind of readjust to wherever they were. So, you know, ultimately, I think that it's a positive for gold, Bitcoin as well, right? Any sort of destabilization in the world is likely going to push people into kind of the safety assets, which is mostly gold. But you can argue that over time, Bitcoin should become more of that safety as safety asset. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, bottom line is, I think that would be a positive for gold. I just don't think it would be the hardcore thing that really keeps it up. Because at some point, again, the market says, okay, well, now they took it over. I right, well, what's next? You know, it's over. And, and, you know, and again, I'm not, not to make light of the Ukrainian struggle here, but I think the market, the way the market interprets it is, is how we have to focus as investors. That's fair. If we look at Bitcoin, I kind of want to go back to Bitcoin mm -hmm. here for a little focus. I know that you do really like it, actually. Um, it's just more for this year that you are yeah. bearish about it. Um, and I know you predicted earlier this year, you know, that it was going to decline and it did. And now Bitcoin, obviously it's, it's very volatile. It's, it's coming back up again, but I know you were strong with saying that eventually you believe it's going to fall below 20,000. And so I was curious to know, what is your update on that? Yeah. So that as of now, the charts haven't changed. This bounce has been a beautiful bounce. Um, interestingly enough, the, the fall from the fall from November's high is identical to the fall from the April high to the lows before we went back up. So, I mean, there's some symmetry in the chart that gave us the idea that we would bounce. I did go along some of the cryptos at the lows around 33 to 35,000. I am out mostly at this point because I still think there's more downside, but ultimately I look at Bitcoin as a risk on asset, right? I mean, any, any, any asset that in bear markets declines 80%, which is what Bitcoin's done historically, you have to say that's risky, right? So it's a risk asset. Um, with that, with the Fed tightening, just like tech stocks have started to decline, you have to assume Bitcoin will as well. So if, if the Fed, if we believe the Fed that they're going to hike rates later this year and that inflation is going to be more of an issue, in the short term, that's a negative. In addition, I think it's important to recognize that Bitcoin and cryptos overall, they have to have their dot com collapse. Right. So you've got so much froth in there. There's like 10,000 plus coins out there. I couldn't even name more than maybe 30 of them right now. I mean, there's just ones you've never heard of, ones that have no use, ones that were created as jokes, which is, I mean, you know, and, and that have, you know, $60 billion valuations. So, I mean, with all of that, you need a flush out. And what's interesting about this, there's so many similarities to the dot coms, right? So in, in, in 2000, we had Amazon topping out. The chart on Amazon, when it topped out, in 99, 2000 looks almost identical to the kind of the M top that we have in Bitcoin right now. All right. In addition, some other cool things, the, the dot coms at their height, when you added up all the market caps, just under $3 trillion in November, when we were at the highs on crypt in the crypto market, the, the market cap of all cryptos was just slightly over $3 trillion. And then my favorite one, because the Super Bowl was just this past Sunday is that in 2000, you had 14 commercials for dot coms. In 99, just two, right? So it was, it was a lot of commercials in 2000 that basically was called the dot com Super Bowl. And after that, I think at least five of those companies went out of business. And I think um, maybe five others were bought out and then five survived. But the idea is that the dot com wipeout, it washed out all the junk and then it enabled the best to survive, right? It's almost Darwinian in that sense. So you're looking at that same kind of thing that needs to happen in the crypto world. You need to see a flush. Unfortunately, even though I think Bitcoin will survive and thrive long term, it probably gets sub 20,000 in that washout. Amazon, interestingly enough, was $110 in early 2000. It went down to $5 in the dot com collapse. Now look at it, right? It's now 3,300 or something. I mean, so you would have made a ton of money even if you held it from $100. So that's fine. If people want to do that with Bitcoin, I would say, hey, listen, if you're a long-term holder, hold it. For me, I'm a shorter-term investor. And if my charts are telling me it's going lower, I'd much prefer to see and buy at a lower level. So I'll swing trade it in here, but my longer-term investments will be when we get that final flush out in the crypto space. I got you there. So you're kind of waiting right now to get in at a lower low for it just because of, you know, in terms of like the near term of, of maybe a, a potential crash, right? That that kind of might happen in like the market. So that actually brings me to my next question that, you know, a lot of analysts, right, are, are also in support that inflation is, you know, running hot and that could lead to a big bang, right? Where, where, where the Fed is going to, you know, do a rate hike and it, it could even be this March. So if this situation plays out, 
what will happen to uh, Bitcoin and gold? It sounds like I already kind of know where you're going with Bitcoin, but I'm still curious, you know, to get an explanation to kind of justify this. Mm. And is it expected that uh, for gold's side, that it's going to make its next move higher right away? Or is it going to get hit and then make its next move higher? Yeah. So, so the great thing about the markets is in general, they always, they're, they're interpreting and understanding what the Fed is going to do. And the Fed has always been good about that in terms of saying, hey, guys, be ready. We're going to raise. And, and you can even see the market. They have these metrics that price in and, and they are pricing in, I think right now, four or five rate hikes, at least in 2022. So the market's already adjusting to that. You know, now if the Fed surprises us with like a 50 basis point hike and then another 50, I mean, that's where the markets are going to start to get crazier. But I think for the most part, the more rate hikes and the more tighter monetary monetary policy gets, the more volatility you'll see in the overall markets, including in crypto. And I think the better for gold it is. I mean, it shows that the Fed is really worried about inflation. That's ultimately a positive for gold. As I said, eventually that's going to be a positive for Bitcoin, but not until you get this final flush out where it, it finally becomes that asset that should move more like gold. Okay, gotcha. So that being said, when this fear kicks in, you believe a lot of people are going to hold more to that hard asset rather than the digital asset. Yeah, I mean, just right now, you know, again, I really truly believe that Bitcoin will be 500,000 at some point. I just think that, again, you know, and I didn't even mention this when we were talking about Bitcoin, but you, as a cycle watcher, you also have to kind of just note the cycles. And Bitcoin was created in 2009. 2013, which was four years later, was the first kind of blow off big pop. It ran to 1300, it then dropped to $100. Um, so from 2013 to 2017, which is another four years, that was your next high just under 20,000. So you're going in these four-year cycles. And if you add four years from 2017, you get 2021, which is November. We just had that high. So it implies that that, if you go by cycles, that that should be a top as well. And then I think it's important for investors to understand that historically Bitcoin, now there's not a lot of history, so that's fair, but historically Bitcoin has made an 80% drop every time it puts in a cycle high to the low before it starts moving back up. So if you do price that in, it does give you actually around 10,000, 11,000 as a downside target. So, so all these things, eventually Bitcoin does become a digital gold, but you need regulation in the space. You need you know pension funds to invest. You need in older investors to feel comfortable having cryptocurrency accounts or at least an ETF that tracks it better than the futures ETFs. There's a lot of things that have to happen and before it becomes that asset where people will say, okay, I can hold this safely versus wondering when the next 30% drop in Bitcoin is going to hit overnight. <laughs> Makes sense. If this is going to happen and this situation does play out, do you think silver is going to be another asset that would be a good spot for people to take a look at? Because I know silver usually in history, right? It kind of follows gold's footsteps, right? So yeah. if, if you believe that, you know, gold is going to go up 50% this year, what about silver? What's going to happen to that? Yeah. So silver is a little trickier. And this is the this is the caveat that investors in silver have to know. So number one, historically, it does outperform gold. So you know, if gold is up, let's say 50%, it implies maybe silver could be up 100%. The one thing we have to be careful on with silver is that it's, it's an industrial metal as well. What that means is that it's used in the production of you know, you know, electric cars and all these other things. So if by chance the Fed does slow the economy and pushes us into recession, there is a chance that you see an underperformance in the near term before it starts to really outperform in the longer term. So time horizon, three to five years, I think I honestly do think silver outperforms gold. Um, in the next year or six months, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And again, you know, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just not sure. It's, it's, it, there's a chance it could drop to about 19, 19 and a half on spot silver. If it did, I would be a big buyer there. That's a huge, huge support level. Um, but it may not even get down there. Maybe it just goes sideways and eventually breaks out. But for me, I'm more so invested in gold versus silver at this particular time, even though longer term, I do like silver. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, so Garrett, I also know that you do like small cap stocks. Based on that, what is your top investment idea for this year? Wow. So, so for small caps, you know, number one, you got to be careful in bear markets. Bear markets, 
small caps suffer the most, right? Money goes away because they're the riskiest of stocks to invest in. They haven't made it yet. That's why they're still a small cap. I would dare say this. My best investment isn't a small cap, but it is a sector. Look at the Chinese stocks, all right? Um, institutions are extremely underinvested and in in you know, basically global names, Chinese stocks, South American companies as well. And they've already been hit. If you look at Alibaba, it's down from $325 to basically $125. It's trading at a PE of like 17 or 15 or something like that. Now, of course, there's risks in China, right? We know that there's risks of regulation. But again, based on how much they've dropped and how under allocated a lot of investments, investment advisors are in the space, I do think that that's the place to look. I think money is going to rotate away from the U.S. because the Fed is now playing hardball with raising rates, and they're going to look for places where the monetary policy is a lot looser, like China. Okay, great. So we'll have to keep our eyes peeled and and kind of uh, keep an eye out on some of these Chinese stocks. I've, I've actually heard you say this before, probably on another interview with with uh, David Lin yeah. uh, from Keiko. Okay, cool. Um, so you know what? A lot of this talk has been good, Gareth, but at the same time, just because you know, you're know you invested in, in, in some of these assets, that shouldn't be the reason why someone invests or goes into it, right? right? So right. that being said, what advice would you give to someone you know, who is listening right now who wants to better educate themselves you know, before making any investment decision? So, so number one, I would say start taking a look at charts. They're amazing in terms of taking away the emotional side of investing. If you're someone who maybe chased Bitcoin at 60,000, or if you chased the market when it was at its recent highs, the charts are alerting us not to do that. And it does help you keep grounded. Um, the other thing is, Go into a trade. The average investor goes into a trade saying, hey, I'm going to be right. So I'm going to put a lot of money in because I can make a lot of money. I go in trades because I've learned, unfortunately, my lessons very many times. I go in my trades expecting potentially to be wrong. I, I like the level, but I'm honest with myself that I could be wrong. And what that does is it keeps my position size small. And then I can dollar cost average at the next technical level. Eventually, you'll get the bounce, especially if it's a good quality thing, right? So again, go in. Don't be cocky. Don't try to make a million dollars overnight. Go in with a long-term plan. Allocate your money ahead of time. Say, I'm willing to commit X amount of dollars to this position. Maybe I'll buy 25% of that now, maybe 25% next month. Do it that way. You'll end up being much wealthier later on. I, would, I always say this to people, but if I could go undo the hundreds of mistakes I made early in my career, I would have so much more money than I do today if I did it the right way. And again, you know, in, in, when you're young or when you have, have money and you're just starting, you just want to hit home runs. But really what you want to do is you want to do singles and doubles because in the investment world, you want to be a high percentage investor. So for, as a baseball analogy, you know, you want to be kind of the Wade Boggs or you want to be the Tony Gwynn. You don't want to be the, the Mark McGuire because Mark McGuire, you know, not, not only did he do steroids, but he, he, he struck out amazingly amount, a huge amount of times. And when you strike out in the investing world, it means you take a big hit. We can't afford that. So you want to be a singles and doubles hitter. Occasionally, you'll hit a home run just by luck. But again, singles and doubles gets you to a fortune. I think you just uh, gave some really good advice. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, and I think it also kind of, uh, if I could add, it also sounds like that because you don't go all in, which you should never go all in, um, it's important to have that dry powder there, right? Yes. Uh, for you to add to positions or kind of like you said, if you see that lower, lower, or better entry, um, it's important to, to make sure that you are cautious as well as protect yourself. So when there is an even better opportunity to be able to go in, that's right. Gary, something that I want to talk about. So this is more about, um, kind of like the theme of my podcast, right? Yeah. So someone could be financially well, but they cannot be physically well, right. Or vice versa, right. They can be physically well, but not financially well. Um, so I know you and your wife and your whole family value physical activity. Um, I know you are active members at Orange Theory Fitness, which I also work there too. So I, I, it's so cool to connect with another Orange Theory bug. Uh, but how has this fitness community had an impact on your overall health and wellness? 
Uh, it's been huge, right? So, so, you know, I I started getting in shape when I went to college. So this was a long time ago. It's always been part of my, my regimen. It's not to say that I don't miss days here and there because I get too busy. Uh, Today was one of those days where I was just so busy that, that I didn't, you know, sometimes adding it in and rushing to the gym, it just adds it onto your plate, but keeping it in your focus it does de-stress your body. It lets your mind rest better at night. Um, I do deal with anxiety because of the, you know, not that there's a lot of stress. Well, it, it's more that there's so many things that I'm watching throughout the day, you know, whether it's crypto prices or this, and I'm trading and I'm doing my own accounts and I'm telling people, you know, there's just so many things that I'm doing that it's just so intense that it builds in your body, right? And so you need that outlet as a, as a you know, as, some, as physical fitness to kind of get that energy out of your body. I always sleep way better once I do kind of a good, good workout like that. And it, it has been amazing. I mean, you know, as I get older, living for my kids, living for whatever, you know, just to be around and, and be able to enjoy life is becoming more and more important. And I think that's where it really comes in as well. So especially if you're an investor or a trader, someone like me who sits behind your computer eight, 10 hours a day, you, you, you can't expect to just do that and not have some sort of physical activity in your life. So I, I really strongly recommend it. I try to try to eat healthy. I eat a big salad every day. It's not to say I don't get a cheeseburger once in a while or something like that, but I do try to want, watch what I eat as well. Because again, you got to treat your body like an investment, right? You got to put good things into your investment so that you get the returns later on. Awesome, Gareth. Yeah, thanks for kind of, you know, expanding on that because I believe, you know, we always want to be at our best level, right? And everything that you just shared, right? There are different times probably in like the market where you feel stress and you yeah. you need to make sure that you are grounded and that you are your best, right? So I, I appreciate that. So Gareth, as you know, the purpose of this podcast is to inspire people to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. So what is your definition of greatness? Wow. I think greatness is being the best you can be, not only in your career, but, you know, as a stand up individual, you know, you want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror, um, especially in the financial industry. I think that's so, so important because there are so many shady things. And I think that's one of the reasons why the company has done as well as it has since 2007. And here we are in 2022, because we were always ones to just be straight up and just, you know, tell it how it is, not only help people make money, but, you know, when we mess up, we mess up, you know, it just, it is the nature of the beast. You're never going to win every trade and you have to just be open and honest about it. So I think it's multifold. I think the education has been huge, you know, I just helping someone, if I can just reach someone and help them understand to avoid a trade where they would have bought Bitcoin, let's say at 65,000, and now it's at 44,000 and it saved them X amount of dollars. Um, and now maybe they start to look into investment investing via charts more and technical analysis. Maybe it ends up turning out to be a huge change in their life. So I think, again, the idea is do well in what you do, strive as hard as you can and push as hard as you can, but also make sure that you're doing things to add a, add better to society and to the, the greater good of people out there. And again, that goodwill, it, it not only makes you feel good, but it also helps the world. Hopefully, you know, it, it pays people back and maybe someone else does something. I mean, you hope that there's that domino or chain reaction out there as well. That's an awesome uh, definition and, and as well as perspective there, uh, Gareth. So I appreciate yeah. you for kind of sharing that. Um, and I, I definitely liked the aspect that you kind of said that it's it's not only in terms of, you know, in that specific area that you're achieving greatness, you know, like financially, but overall as a person, right? Being a good yeah. person and also giving back, right? Also uh, paying it forward. So Gareth, who is a future guest that you would like to see on the show one day? Oh my goodness. Wow. Um, that's a good question. Let's see here. I mean, that, wow. I honestly don't even, you surprised me with that one. Let me see. I mean, I I would say I would love to get on someone who's, who's a motivational speaker, you know, um, someone who has, has met with major diversity in their life, you know, whether it's a handicap or something like that. To me, that's always the most inspiring because, you know, I've been blessed that I, I don't have handicaps and, and, you know, I've, I've struggled, but when you, you hear from people that have other, overcome other things much harder than myself, that's, I mean, it just, it, honestly, it motivates me 10 times more because I'm like, wow, if they can do it, 
then I should be really being, you know, like I have nothing to complain about, you know, essentially. So, so, I mean, I don't know the specifics of it or who I would say, but, but those type of people, I mean, there's just, it's incredible to hear their stories, hear what they've overcome. And, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And honestly, I give them all the credit in the world. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I will, I will take you up on that. And I also have some good news to share with you is there's a couple of individuals that were already on, on my list, specifically in that area. And one person that comes to mind, his name is uh, Spencer West. So mm-hmm. he, he worked with, I don't know if you know of him, but he worked with Free the Children as well as Me to We. And I actually met him way back in 2008 when I was in grade nine back in the day. And um, pretty much when I met him, he was giving a motivational speech because he doesn't mm-hmm. have legs. He, you know, he has his arms, he has his upper body, but he gave his whole motivational speech, just walking on his hands the whole time on like the stage. Wow. Um, and just, just his whole journey and story and all that stuff. Mm. Uh, so he's definitely an, an individual that I have. And, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll actually be sure that when I get someone like Spencer West or even Spencer West, I'll be sure to let you know. Please do. That would be amazing. Thank you. Gary, just kind of finishing off here, where can our listeners go to connect with you online? Sure. So, so best way is Twitter uh, at Gareth Soloway. So just at my first name, last name, and that's all, you know, usually I'll post a few charts up, really some interesting content, um, you know, and it's all free, obviously. And then if you're really interested in getting my exact trades in the moneystocks.com, I have a service called Verified Investing Alerts. And then I actually recently launched a crypto service um, on uh, verifiedinvestingcrypto.com. So it's a different website, but again, same thing. I do a daily video, hardcore technical analysis, teaching it, talking about the levels, look for this move. And then I also post my trades up there as well. So lots of places to find me. And, and Ben, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's honestly been a, a true honor. First off, I want to say it's been an honor to have you on. Um, it's been a pleasure to finally get to know you because I've been following your work for the last couple of years. Um, and I will be sure everything that you just said, I will be sure in the podcast notes uh, to put everything there so people know where to go uh, to find you. And lastly, I just want to thank you for making time uh, for your first appearance on Living Your Greatness. And uh, I look forward to having you back on the show one day. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. And I look forward to being back. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added value, please subscribe, leave a rating and make a review. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not to be considered personal, legal, or investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or any other product. It is based on opinions, current events, press releases, and interviews, but is not infallible. It may contain errors and living your greatness offers no inferred or explicit warranty as to the accuracy of the information presented. If personal advice is needed, Consult a qualified legal tax or investment professional. Do not base any investment decision on the information contained on Living Your Greatness or our videos.